they jump too many spaces, but you can't be replaced. Welcome to Inside Opt. Today we want to talk about why optimality is a false idol. We need to talk. Sounds like a very strange statement for somebody who is in optimization to say you should not strive for optimality. And that is not at all what I'm saying. Yes, you're trying to find solutions that are as good as possible, but you shouldn't get obsessed with trying to prove that your solutions are optimal, plain and simple, because that is unattainable. Unattainable, you say, are there solvers that prove optimality, that actually find the provably best solution that is there? Let's have a look at some real examples, shall we? Here's a production planning example. Say we're producing sushi dishes and we have two of them. We have two kinds of dishes and we need to decide how many of each we're going to produce. So we want to know quantity 1 and quantity 2, called Q1 and Q2 over here, and we have limited production capabilities because ingredients and machines are shared among both products. And you see that here in constraints 1 and 2. Now, to make any profit, we obviously it's not enough to produce our products, we also need to sell them. And how much of product 1 are we actually going to sell? Well, first of all, we're not going to sell more than what we produced. And then secondly, we're not going to sell more than will be bought. So what is the demand for product one? In this case here, we have a pretty good idea that it's around 7,000 units that we're going to sell. But it comes with some uncertainty. This is a forecast that goes into our optimization model. And the same thing is true for the quantity that will be sold of our dish number two, um, which is again not more than quantity two that we produced, and what the demand for the second one is, which is expected to be 10,500 units. Now, if we do not sell all of our products, we get excess. And this is called excess one and excess two. Um, and it is, of course, the difference between the quantity we produced and the number that is sold, which is guaranteed to be greater or equal zero by constraints three and five. Now, what does our profit look like? Well, for each unit that we sell of product one, we're making 30 cents. For product two, we're making 45 cents. But if we have excess and we produce that dish and don't sell it, we actually wasted cost of $2.70 for product one and $6 for product two. And this is our optimization problem. So how can we get an optimal solution to this problem? Well, the standard industry approach is to simply forget the noise. We have a fantastic forecast, and this is in fact correct, as you will see in a moment. The expected demand for product one is 7,000 units. The expected demand for this second dish is 10,500 units. But if we forget the noise, we will end up with a very, very bad situation. So you see here is two kinds of noises that we might have. So two shapes of noises, if you want. On the left hand side, you see normal noise. Um, the expected noise factor is one. The expectation here of the normal distribution is one. And it distributes with 0.1 standard deviation. On the right hand side, you see an, a negative exponential, if you want. So um, we anchor the demand at 1.1 and then subtract from the uh, exp according to the exponential distribution with lambda 10, which also gives us an expected noise factor of 1 and also a standard deviation of 0.1. But of course, the shape of this function looks very different than the normal one. It is skewed to the left. And now look at the table below. If you do predict then optimize, if you simply forget the noise, in both cases you get the same solution. Well, obviously, because well, the expected demand is 7,000, 10,500. And for this, a mix into a program will come back and say, let's produce 6,000 of dish number one and 10,500 of dish number two. If, on the other hand, you actually solve this problem using the distributional information on your uncertainty, 
with Seeker, for example, the server that we sell here at Inside Opt, you see that our mean profit is 5,549, where the predict and optimize profit, the average predict and optimize profit is 3,756 for the normal distribution. For the exponential distribution, our even with Seeker, the optimized profit is about 10% left, less, because, well, we have uh, higher dips uh, in demand according to this kind of noise. And consequently, our average is now 5,085, but that is a heck of a lot better than what Predict and Optimize gives you, which is 3,851. 24% less than what you achieve with Seeker if you use a MIP for this problem. And for the normally distributed, it's even over 30% worse than what it is. Now, for a business, it's often not only important what, you, what your results are on average, but also how this income varies over time. So let's look at the 10% quantile, the 10% worst performances that we're actually seeing when we are picking a, um, a demand from our distribution. Um, and we're looking at the 10% worst outcomes that we're seeing. With Seeker, on the normal distribution, you're still making $5,043. With Predict and Optimize, you're losing $2,200. And on the other side, for the exponential distribution, uh, with Seeker, you're still making about $4,200, whereas Predict and Optimize loses two thousand, almost $2,600. 160% worse than what you achieve if you do this with stochastic optimization. The difference? Well, Seeker doesn't bother trying to prove optimality. It tries to find better solutions for the actual problem, incorporating the noise. Whereas Predict and Optimize says, hey, I have a fantastic forecast. And again, the forecast is correct. Forecast is absolutely correct. On average, we are seeing 7,000 and 10,500 in demand. However, it distributes, it varies. And this variation means that for many futures that have a realistic chance of happening, this solution that you're proposing, the 6,000, 10,500 that PTO is proposing here, is just abysmally bad. And that is the difference. So let's have a look here. Maybe we can still get the best of both worlds. Maybe we can do stochastic optimization and still have optimality. So let's not just look at one predicted future by just looking at the mean scenario for the demand, but let's sample from our distribution, say 10 scenarios. And maybe in practice, this is still doable that we can actually find an optimal solution for those 10 scenarios that we sample. So what you see here is on the x-axis, is what those 10 scenarios that we sampled think how good the solution is. And on the y-axis here, that is depicted with mean, we actually evaluated this solution on a million scenarios in order to assess how good it really is. And here's a result. You pick 10 scenarios from our uh, distribution in accordance with the uh, with the actual uh, noise uh, uh, scenario that we're in, so either normal or exponential. In this case here, I believe this is the normal data. And you see here that those 10 scenarios, yeah, you know, on the x-axis where are we? Somewhere around 5,550. And in reality, we are maybe around 5,500. So it's not a bad estimate that we're having. But now comes the kicker. Say we're sampling 10 other scenarios. And suddenly our assessment is much, much better. It's now almost 6,200, but in reality our performance has dropped to below 5,200. And this continues with different scenarios that you're sampling. And note, please, that this is a completely ideal situation. In this case here, we have access to the true noise distribution, and we can sample from it IID, identically distributed and independently drawn samples that we can take from that distribution and, and generate 10 scenarios to do this. Now, we repeated this process 100 times, and this is how the performance distributes 
compared to the, the hallucinated performance, the self-assessed performance of those 10 scenarios and what it really is. And you see that there is a huge variation here. It matters tremendously what kind of scenarios you're sampling with respect to what kind of solution you're actually getting from your solver. Now let's zoom out a little bit so that we can actually plot PTO. Um, PTO is actually far to the right and far to the bottom, um, which is exactly what you would expect, right? If you forget the noise, um, you're just massively overconfident in terms of how much you think you can you can actually save or how much profit you can actually squeeze out of the problem. But in reality, it is a very, very brittle solution that just doesn't generalize to any other futures. And that is why the mean performance is so bad, 30% worse than what you achieve with Seeker. Okay, maybe if we afford more scenarios. Okay, so here you see the data for 20 scenarios, 40 scenarios, 80 scenarios and whatnot. And again, this is with the standard deviation 0.1. And you see that even at 320 scenarios, which is probably a hard limit for most applications, where you could still maybe, maybe very remotely chance, have a chance to actually find and prove an optimal solution, there is variation in this. So if somebody is obsessed with optimality and, and insists on having a provably optimal solution, you ought to ask them how they are actually going to get you a sample set, even if it's uh, 300 scenarios wide, that will actually give you an optimal solution. Unless they tell you how to sample this and what to optimize for, what futures to optimize for, you will not have an optimal solution. In fact, even at 10,000 scenarios, which is what we use in Seeker, you still have some bandwidths there. This is not a line, what you're seeing on the right-hand side there. This actually has some thickness to it. It is becoming less, of course. This is resilience. This is the reason why we build Seeker. It is a very, very resilient solution that you're going to get if you're actually sampling, if you're actually trying to find a solution with that many scenarios. But it's not like we could prove optimality here, plain and simple, because even over 10,000 scenarios, there are different ways to sample them. And depending on what that set of 10,000 scenarios looks like, you're going to get difference in performance. Slight, but still existent. And the same thing is, of course, true for the exponential noise, which we're plotting here at the bottom. The picture is really the same. With more scenarios, you can rein it in. But it's not like you got rid of all variability that comes from the scenarios themselves. This problem is exacerbated in the tail. So if you're looking again, you know, for businesses, what matters is the, the variability of results that you're actually seeing. And you see here that the, that the noise that you're getting, even if you have 320 scenarios here in the tail, so if you're facing a scenario all of a sudden where, you, um, where you're like in the 10% worst, say this was a daily decision that you need to make on how many sushis, uh, sushi dishes you're actually making, we're talking about five weeks in the year here. So this is 10% is, is, is not minuscule. Um, and the quantile here tells you what is the best day of those five weeks in the year. And you see here that... Um, that this best day can be pretty horrible compared, uh, you know, from, from set of scenarios to scenarios. Let's look at the 320 scenarios again. There is a, a decent 10% variation in the performance of this 10% quantile over here, which again marks the best day in the five worst weeks of the year. Um, and you see here that this variability is there and it's solely due to the way on how you sampled your scenarios. And the same thing is, uh, is true and, and even worse uh, for the exponential noise, which again has a little bit more skew to the left, but is still exponentially declining. It's not like we use the Poisson here or something like this that is heavy tailed. Is the probability of seeing something completely abysmal is declining exponentially and nevertheless, just a little bit more skew and you see how much bigger the tail performance um, is varying with respect to the scenarios that you're sampling. Now, what you can do is you can try and, and remove the noise as much as you can. And that is a good thing to do. 
you know, talk to your machine learners and see if they can actually make you demand and, um, um, you know, g give you a distribution um, for the posterior that doesn't unnecessarily vary. So there is no uncertainty that comes from the model itself, but that there will always be some remaining uncertainty, which is simply due to the fact that there is not enough signal in the features that feed into your machine learning model in order to perfectly predict what the demand for sushi dishes is going to be tomorrow. You just don't have all the information. And you see here that even at 10,000 scenarios and 5% noise, um, which, would be, which would be a very, very good forecast, um, you still don't have a line over there. There is still variability and consequently optimality is nothing short of a myth.